Hello, this is Learning with Lowell with your host, Lowell Thompson. You can find this podcast, other episodes, anywhere where podcasts can be found, iTunes, what have you. This podcast is about biotech, science, anything related to that. We have new episodes every Tuesday. We put out a new email every Monday, and there's usually some posts throughout the week. Today we have Dr. Brandon Friends with Cyrus Biotechnology, who worked at the Institute for Protein Design. We get into protein engineering, uh, how to be an evil genius on an island protein topics basically a lot of stuff that i've really been curious about we really got into them it's a really fun discussion and at the end we get into some actual very specific things that everyone can do to help out what are what are the things that you love about what you do that you tend to come back to at the end of every day that makes you want to get up and excited to do what you're doing yeah um so it, it depends on how specific you want to get uh on like the broad level uh, just being in the biotech industry and being particularly in the field of protein engineering, um, it, it's really exciting because it feels like you know we're really pushing some novel technology that's going to be really important uh, for improving human well-being. Um, for decades, uh, forever, basically, medicine has been dominated by small molecule drugs. And I think we're starting to enter a new age where we can really be a lot more um, precise and, and take a more engineering style approach to dealing with biology. Uh, and with all the stuff we've been doing for protein engineering, um, you know, I, I think that there's a huge amount of application there that hasn't been tapped yet. And that really excites me. Um, and then on a more specific like day to day level um, I discovered during grad school that I really love coding, <laughs> actually, and working on the computer. Um, so it feels like I just get to solve puzzles all day and paid for it. So uh, I, I definitely love that aspect of it. I love coding. I love kind of thinking about these different things and uh, connecting all the kind of abstract ideas into making something that actually works. So uh, I would say that. <laughs> what are some? What are the coding languages that you tend to use? Uh, yeah, so uh, Rosetta, which is the software that was developed out of the Baker Lab and is kind of the backbone of both the company I work for now and a lot of the kind of protein engineering, um, just protein engineering in general, the whole field. Rosetta is kind of the dominant software for that. So that's all written in C++. Um, and so I do development in C++ for that. And then there's also a ton of like job management or various other kind of data analysis tools uh, or scripts that I need to write. And so I do most of that in Python. Uh, so, yeah. And then I've dabbled around in other languages as well. But those are the ones that I use a lot. Yeah, I've never... When, I, when you when we were talking in the for people who were listening we were, we had some email exchange and you and you mentioned uh, Rosetta Stone, Rosetta I was like he can't be talking about the language learning stuff <laughs> program <laughs> so I had to I had to look it up because I wouldn't be like oh so you so you use uh, Rosetta language learning to do your coding it's like <laughs> yeah yeah so so. Yeah, very different than the uh, <laughs> than the language learning tool. No, I mean it's it, they're both the, the names are both based off the Rosetta Stone, obviously, which is you know uh, that idea. The, the idea behind the Rosetta for protein is translating the amino acid sequence into the three dimensional shape of the structure. Um, so I think that's that's how they got the name for that. But yeah, sometimes people get confusing. <laughs> Rosetta, the protein folding software. You you cut off for a second. Yeah. Sorry, I just said that the uh, the Rosetta, the protein folding software, is definitely the lesser known of the two, mm -hmm. but they're they're very different software tools, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So when it comes to actually using proteins, you, you mentioned that we in the past we kind of had like single molecules when it comes to like drug development. How big of a how big of a deal like is like for people who are listening in that are maybe not as inclined or up on what how influential proteins are going to be? How big of a deal is that to be able to use proteins to be specific? How big of an impact will that be on people's lives? So there's how how big will it be and how how big is the potential? Um, <laughs> the second one is harder to answer because we'll have to see as the science moves forward. Um, but if you think about what you can do with small molecules, like it's fairly limited. For the most part, they're really good at turning things off, which is very powerful, right? Like if you can turn off, you know, the uh, critical components of a virus like HIV, that's huge. That can be really, really powerful. Um, but 
there's a limit to what kind of problems you can tackle with basically turning proteins off. <laughs> um, by being able to design and engineer our own proteins, we can uh, start to design new functionality and put it into the body. Um, so if you look at you know the things being done by PVP Biologics with the with the enzyme that breaks down gluten in the stomach, I mean, that's not a problem you can solve with small molecules. Uh, you need something as large and sophisticated as an enzyme to, to break that down. Um, and there's all sorts of other applications for things like this. Um, you can think about drug delivery uh, because you can design specificity into your proteins. Uh, you can target things. And um, one of the groups in the Institute of Protein Design, Neil King's lab, uh, have developed these large protein nano cages, and they've been able to do all sorts of crazy things with those, uh, such as packaging RNA into the center of the cage, and then you can put a targeting domain on it, and hopefully the idea is um, deliver those to specific cell types based on that targeting, uh, which you it, which this targeting domain itself is something another engineered protein. Um, there's all sorts of implications for vaccine design since you can actually control the atoms, you know, at the atomic level and put them in space in a specific arrangement. That gives you a ton of power for, you know, setting up your vaccine to be very specific to, to elicit the style of antibodies that you want, that you know are necessary to be an effect, effective um, for a vaccine. Uh, and then there's all sorts of other applications people are using them for. Um, people are looking at uh, like material design and designing crystals. Um, so, I mean, there's there's a huge amount of opportunity here um, for all sorts of different things. It, it really just kind of depends on what you want to do. But there's a there's a, a ton of unexplored space that we're just beginning to pursue. So to take a step back and kind of better define proteins, and you can, maybe this is my test to see how well, you know, crash course and the resources I used to uh, brush up on this. Proteins to me, they're basically the foundation of almost everything that goes on in our body. Repair, maintain, they produce, you know, they like regulate energy to some extent, ho hormones, yeah. antibodies and that type of stuff. So I thought of it, sent to my, my chemistry knowledge, like they kind of seem like carbon. Like they have like so many interrelated functions. Is that like a good? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, so almost everything that your body does is done by proteins for the most part, uh, whether it's breaking down a chemical to convert it into energy or, you know, to ATP to use for energy, uh, any kind of enzymatic catalysis, uh, they form, you know, structures, uh, move your muscles like ever. I mean, you know, the bulk of everything that gets done in your body is done by proteins. Uh, if you want to go super basics, uh, uh, you know, proteins are made up of 20 unique amino acids and they get, uh, arranged in kind of some specific order that causes them to form some three dimensional shape. And that specific shape is what allows them to do their job. So the whole goal of the field of protein engineering is figuring out what sequence will give us the shape that we need to do, uh, you know, whatever specific engineering task we're trying to put in, um, so, yeah, so that's that's really the the goal is to try and figure out how we can design the sequence. But that gives you a huge amount of flexibility because, um, you know, biology is already working with these systems. I mean, people talk about, you know, like nanomachines all the time. But, I mean, really, like, you are mostly a nano, uh, you know, a combination of these little nano machines that are proteins that do everything. Um, and, yeah, the, I, everything important that gets done is almost always done by proteins with some exceptions but um you know for the most part no they're, they're what makes life happen i was reading a while ago that mitochondria and like this is great because you, you researched it in your your backstory which we'll eventually get to <laughs> or we'll just get through it throughout our discussion sure. and when it, when it comes to our cells like mitochondria is kind of like where the energy comes from right like it's a power plant and there's like this idea that it, we kind of co-opted it. Our cells were like, hey, we like that. And we kind of like absorbed it into us. The mitochondria at one point was like yeah. its own little thing. Well, one, is that true? Like, is that a real thing? Yeah, I mean, obviously we're talking about something that we can't observe, but there's a lot of evidence that suggests that that is the case. Yeah. Um, for example, mitochondria have their own genome uh, and they produce proteins that are specifically encoded in, in their little genome inside. Um, and they function very similar to something like an independent or no, or an independent organism. Um, and 
Now, over time, a lot of the genes have been moved out of the mitochondrial genome into the nuclear genome. Um, so, it, you know, it, it obviously couldn't, you know, survive by itself. But yeah, there's there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that probably is the case. Um, uh, particularly just, like I said, the, the ability or the, the, the fact that it has its own genome and own replication machinery and even a slightly different genetic code all, uh, all indicate that it was at one point just an entirely different organism that somehow got fused um, with, you know, early bacterial cells. And just to, just to note to our, our listeners that the fun thing with scientists is that whenever they do research, it's always the research supports what's going on. Like it doesn't really prove things. And that's kind of like the fun thing. Yeah. Then it's like really easy to kind of reassess. You don't have to be like hard coded. Like this is the way it is. It's like with this data, this information, we can then it suggests this, which you know is very, you know, makes sense. Like oh, it has its own ability to you know replicate, and it has like a little membrane and stuff. So, but I think that's always like really important. Yeah. Like as a as like consumers yeah. for yeah as a yeah. I mean, oh sorry, go ahead. As consumers who you know are, are listening to the news and it's like science. Scientists prove Earth flat. Like <laughs> one, yeah, no, <laughs> just yeah. no on that. But two, yeah. buzzword to pay attention to is that like if, yeah. if if someone says definitively, that's usually when you should really start looking into it more. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, scientists use a a method of what's called Bayesian thinking, where you essentially assign a, a probability to some position based on the amount of evidence you have and the more evidence you have that supports some position the higher probability that that thing is true but you never reach certainty i mean you you know you can always go back to the idea like maybe we're all living in the matrix and everything we know is a lie you can't ever prove anything with 100 percent certainty so you have to form some probability based on on the amount of evidence you have and then when new evidence comes in you change the probability of that belief so, yeah, it's definitely it, – there's never like anything, you know, especially like you were saying, you know, in, in consumers or in like the, the public world, uh, it, we talk about science as like, oh, this is true or this has been shown with science. And it's like, okay, yeah, I mean you're, you're, you're making shorthand for we're pretty confident that that is true. But, you know, we always leave ourselves open to the idea that when new evidence might come in and we might have to change our position. When it comes to proteins, and this is like kind of where I was going with this like mitochondria comment or a uh, question, proteins aren't naturally occurring, right? So then why, like, do we know why they were evolved? Like why, like they came about to existing? Is it just like uh, they're the most effective way of doing what they do? Or is it, are there any like theories behind that? Yeah. So, um, origin of life in abiogenesis. You're, you're cutting so, out. Here, at least the one that seems the most... Oh, yeah, sorry. I think my internet's a little weak. Uh, oh, sorry. We're doing good for the most part. It's like uh, once every 15 minutes. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, the, the dominant idea is the RNA world hypothesis. Have you heard about that? The what hypothesis? I'm sorry. The RNA world hypothesis? No, I have not, but it sounds fun. <laughs> yeah. So the idea of the RNA world hypothesis is RNA has been shown that it can both act as a genetic storage device um, which is what it's canonically known for. Uh, you know, it carries the message from the DNA in the nucleus outside to the ribosome. Um, but Tom Check showed that uh, RNA could also perform chemistry and act as a catalyst. And so those are kind of the really the things that you need to have life. You need to have some sort of genetic uh, code that can be, you know, evolve and can store information and allow it to pass on to other generations and you also need to be able to carry out complicated chemistry and it turns out that rna can do both of those things and so uh tom check won the nobel prize for um showing that um and so that kind of sparked this idea of the rna world hypothesis that maybe life started with rna because it has this ability to do both of those necessary um reactions or or has both of those features and then the real smoking gun for the RNA world hypothesis was when we solved the structure of the ribosome. So the ribosome is a protein and RNA complex, and it's responsible for synthesizing all of the proteins uh, that your body – well, I shouldn't say all of them, but it, it, it's the, the dominant form of protein synthesis. Uh, and basically it takes the message that's encoded in the messenger RNA and converts it into the protein sequence. And it turns out that once we actually solve the structure, the key component of that, the thing that actually does the chemistry down in the core, 
is RNA. It's not protein. Um, so the idea is, uh, the, you know, that, that's kind of the smoking gun that, okay, RNA is probably what started first, and then RNA figured out how to make proteins. And the reality is as well, RNA can do protein chemistry. It does not do nearly uh, as wide a variety of different types of chemistry and does not have nearly the power because you only have four bases uh, that you get with protein, which has 20 different amino acids with lots of different side chains on it. Um, so yeah, so that's the that's the kind of most popular theory right now and, and the one that seems the most likely for how life and proteins came about. <laughs> yeah, we weren't there to see it. But something I always wonder about when it comes to the future, things are constantly cha changing. Will like new, more advanced proteins or something even more advanced than proteins ever come about? We started with RNA, and the like, protein's much more complicated way of doing some of the basic things that RNA could do. Will there ever be something that's more complicated than proteins? I mean, the, the amount of, of protein space is absolutely enormous. Um, and evolution has only ever explored a very small amount of it, which is part of the reason that we're interested in protein engineering, because uh, just the huge number of combinations you can get by just combining these 20 different amino acids is enormous, like more than the number of atoms in the universe by the time you're at a, you know, a significantly large protein. Um, so evolution will never explore at all, uh, but it will come up with different types of combinations and then... Uh, for more complicated chemistries, I don't know about coming up with an alternative to proteins, but what happens a lot is you can implement or um, uh, you can interact with cofactors. So things like heme groups for, uh, you know, uh, oxygen binding um, or there's other uh, one of the things we're really interested in now, both from an engineering standpoint, but also happens in biology is non canonical amino acids. So there's this 20 that we talked about, but there's also others that can get incorporated, usually through some sort of enzymatic reactions. Um, so that, there's a ton of space that can be explored there. Um, but in, just in terms of just how vast the protein space itself is, even with the canonical 20 amino acids, well, uh, nature will constantly be coming up with new things just using the existing 20 amino acids. Um, but who knows what other kind of things that could get incorporated. I imagine it'll be mostly things that are attached to or interacting with proteins is how it expands. So there's no one in a lab somewhere trying to like do protein 2.0 and like name it after himself or herself? <laughs> um, well, I mean, uh, there's definitely the non-canonical proteins. Uh, so that would not be – they still follow the same kind of idea of proteins, but um, uh, they would – they incorporate different amino acids, which gives you whole different new avenues for chemistry. Um, and then there's, of course, like people like George Church's group, which aren't necessarily doing different proteins, but they're, you know, changing the, the genome uh, or the, the coding of the genome. Uh, and there's a bunch of stuff going on in synthetic biology to make new organisms and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of unexplored space there for sure. Have you ever read the book, The Isle of Dr. Monroe? Uh, I don't think I have, no. Oh, so the uh, modern people, have you ever seen Spy Kids 2? Uh, I think I did, but it was probably like 10 years ago or more <laughs> yeah, no, it's, when it came out. <laughs> yeah, it's really a, it's usually the one that people pick up on before uh, Isle for some reason. Well, I mean, it's more the, like it's the modern version of it. So the, the mm -hmm. concept is that like there's a person on an island and he's like, made little like creature abominations, pig that can literally fly or if I wanted to do that, would I would I need to learn protein engineering or genetic engineering as the best possible way to make me that evil guy in, in that book? <laughs> um, probably some combination of both. Uh, you know, genetic engineering and and manipulating. Uh, I mean, if you're doing that, basically what you're doing is you're taking genes from one organism and putting them into another, which is great for a lot of applications. Um, but if you don't have, if there's no organism that does the thing that you want, then you might have to do protein engineering, um, to engineer that from scratch. So it kind of depends. And even if you're just, uh, you can take existing proteins in nature and optimize them using protein engineering to make them better at what they do or better at whatever thing you want them to do. Um, and so you can definitely 
you know, incorporate that as well. Like that's a big thing in, in biologics or enzyme design or all that kind of things. Like, you know, it, it might be good enough in nature, but you want to operate with it in some different temperature or whatever. And so you need to stabilize it or do sorts of stuff like that. So even if you're, uh, just copying or just taking existing genes and moving them around, you could still do more by enhancing them with different protein engineering strategies. So, yeah, I think both would be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> but you you heard it here, folks. If you want to be an evil genius on an island doing probably unethical things, you need both of these skills. So if I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> keeping with this analogy, what what tools do I need to have a very high quality protein engineering lab, and and how would I go about learning how to use those tools? Sure. So there's different ways to do protein engineering. Um, one of them is more of a, I don't know if brute force is the right word, but um, a method that gets used a lot is uh, directed evolution. And the idea there is you have some protein that does the thing you want poorly. And essentially, what you do is you go in and you start mutating it and generating lots of different variants and then you select the variants that you want and do the same thing on the best ones repeat that process over and over again and you can essentially evolve the protein to be better at some something um for other types of problems or what so the, the baker lab which is where a lot of this protein engineering stuff gets done uh, at least at the institute for protein design um the main strategy is usually to start in the computer uh and have some some goal uh that what you want to do so say you want to evolve or you want to design a protein to bind some small molecule uh say you want this thing to basically act as an antidote uh or you know someone ods on some drug and you want to administer a protein that'll sequester that drug away so it doesn't they don't overdose um so what you do in something like that is you take the small molecule and then you'd put it in the computer and you would uh, find maybe uh, some similar proteins or maybe you have uh, – or if you want to design something in scratch, uh, from scratch, you can do that. It would be de novo protein design. Um, and then you run all sorts of different sampling algorithms and all sorts of stuff like that. And essentially you can design a molecule that will – or you'll design a, a protein sequence that will fold up and finding that enzyme, finding that small molecule. And so usually what you'll do there is design a lot of stuff in the computer because you can do that cheaply and easily. And odds are that, you know, very small percentage of those are actually going to work. But thanks to new DNA sequencing technology, what we can do is, you know, design 10,000 proteins and get a, a DNA chip, especially for doing small stuff. Um, and then we'll, see, we'll synthesize all of those proteins, put them in yeast or whatever, and uh, and then do directed evolution on that. So take all the hits from that and then evolve those. And so that's – if you want to do directed evolution, you have to have something that you can select for, which means you need to have some initial baseline activity. And so usually we'll do the computer to get the baseline activity and then evolve it to get the, the final protein. So that's a very common strategy. Um, but there are other things you can do as well. It depends on what your specific problem is. Thank you for helping me in my ambition to be an evil, evil island man. The, so jumping to, to more practical things, you, mm -hmm. you currently work at uh, Cyrus Biotechnology, correctly, since 2015. Mm -hmm. And I know we wanted to get into the work you're doing there and how advanced proteins have been, like the protein design, I believe, how advanced things yeah. are getting. So I'm curious, before we jump into like how, how great things are, what if we kind of establish the baseline of what things used to be like so that people can kind of get an idea of like how big of a step it is? Sure. Um, so uh, I guess if, if we want to talk about specifically about Cyrus, the company, um, Cyrus exists because the software, Rosetta, for doing protein engineering and protein structure prediction is really what it started out as, is very different to use and very computationally intensive. Um, so if someone wanted to try and use it, they'd have to get a license and they'd have to know a lot of kind of command line level tools uh, and they'd have to know uh, pretty detailed um, 
I guess, the pipelines on how to do different things in Rosetta. And it's very easy to screw those up. You you need a very specific set of flags, uh, which are basically options that you're passing into the program. And if you don't do that right, you get out garbage. So the idea of Cyrus is to make Rosetta user-friendly. And then also, it's a very computationally intensive, um, or it can be, depending on what you're doing, protocol. Uh, and so they also provide all of the backend compute using the cloud. Um, so that's the real reason why the company exists, is because these tools have all been developed in academic labs, and they're often cryptic and difficult to use, and they require a lot of computers that you may or may not have access to. And so the idea of the company is put that on the cloud, build a web user interface for it, and let people do it in a very simple manner. So the big things, uh, I mean, eventually we're going to get into protein engineering a lot more, but uh, that is unfortunately not the thing that has a lot of demand yet, although we're hoping with the success of things like PVP biologics that more and more people will be interested in doing protein design. What a lot of people are interested in now is um, protein structure prediction. So the, the most effective way to do that is what's called homology modeling. And the idea there is you, you have a sequence that you're trying to solve the structure of, and you can go into these different databases, like the protein database, and you can find things that have a similar sequence to your target. And then using uh, a computational tool like Rosetta, which has these complicated physical force fields, you can uh, try and build a model that's based on taking all this knowledge of what's known uh, about proteins that are similar and trying to combine them in together into a hybrid structure that kind of has the correct sequence that you're trying to look for and actually accurately predicts the, the structure of the protein. And so people want to do that for all sorts of different applications. Um, you know, if getting a protein structure can also often be very difficult, especially if, uh, you know, it's a membrane protein or just you can't get a crystal structure of it easily. Um, people will turn to homology modeling. So, so that's uh, a big thing that they offer. Um, a little more on the protein engineering side, one of the things that they also do is um, uh, DDG calculations. That's uh, the, the change in free energy when you mutate residues in the structure. And the idea there is you have a protein, say it's an enzyme that performs some activity, but it's not very stable and it falls apart really easily. Well, you can use the computer to predict mutations that you could make to that protein that would make it more stable. So that's kind of uh, where we were at before is commercial software that could do these things, but not very well. Or this academic software that was really good at it, but was very difficult to use and required kind of an expert user to do. And so now we've kind of moved in and made those tools accessible and kind of push button for people who are normally bench scientists and don't intend to be full time, you know, uh, biophysicists or structural biologists who can now take advantage of some of this stuff uh, without, you know, the huge headache of trying to set everything up. <laughs> how big, how much, I always think of like time as like the big like thing that I measure when it comes to improvements. How much time mm -hmm. will people be able to get back or save in using like that type of technology over you know the dis like kind of a fragmented and not as well connected uh, approach that it used to be? Yeah. Um, well, it depends on on exactly what we're looking at. If if you say you want to get a structure of of some protein and you can build a homology model of it, you can do that in, you know, a day. Whereas if you wanted to get a crystal structure, it could take, you know, months if you can do it at all. It really the crystallography is kind of black magic. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't it's hard to know. Um so that's a huge time save. Um for the delta delta g calculations that's really more about just biasing your your set of things that you're searching towards things that are likely to be correct um so it's maybe a little bit harder to quantify exactly how much time saving is there um but it's you know if if you run a, a test and it doesn't work then you have to do it again obviously there's a huge time investment so if you can re increase your odds of success um you know that's great but it kind of depends on on the specific specific use case for setting up like if you want to say you know how much more time saving is it now um the big thing is just knowledge so it depends on you know if you want to use rosetta without using um the tools provided by cyrus uh 
it depends on how fast you can learn how to use Rosetta. And then there's just also a lot of manual work that goes into it. Like when I wanted to build a homology model, when I was working in an academic lab, I'd have to, you know, go on a different web server and run my sequence and all these different things. And I'd have to manually go in and select the best sequences and the best template models. And then I'd have to set up this XML. Um, so, you know, it could take me a few, you know, an hour or more to do that. Uh, and that's someone who knows exactly what they need to do. They just have to go in and do all the steps. Whereas now, if I want to use the web-based stuff, I can just go on, upload my sequence, press a button, and it takes, you know, two minutes to set up and then, you know, a few hours to run. I guess it depends on the size of the structure. So, yeah, uh, there's the learning curve and there's also just the, the, the busy work of setting up the system and telling the computer exactly what you want it to do. <laughs> and what is your position within this company? Um, yeah, so I started out working there uh, as a contractor uh, while I was still doing my PhD, and I started doing um, like market analysis research, and now, and then I moved on to the science side as they got a little bigger, and um, you know, had someone to do that the marketing side and let me do science. Um, now I'm I'm doing scientific software development, so I work with clients to build software that they need for their specific purposes, and I also go in and do a lot of benchmarking of our existing software and look for ways in which we can improve it, and all kinds of stuff like that. So uh, I guess my I think my official title is scientific software developer, but um, it's a small company. Uh, I think we're a little under twenty people now, um, so you really kind of have to be flexible and be willing to do whatever needs to get done. <laughs> Like, what's like a typical day? Like, oh, actually, if I could jump back for a second. What is, mm -hmm. I keep hearing crystal crystal structure. And oh, I, yeah. I have no idea what that means. Like, what is that? <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, you know, proteins are made out of atoms, and it's kind of hard to figure out what the structure of them looks like because you can't use a traditional, you know, light microscope. So uh, there's, for if you want to solve the structure, uh, the method that's been dominated for years has been X-ray crystallography. Um, and so the idea there is you have to take your protein and you have to get a crystal of it. So you have to try basically what ends up happening is you try a bunch of different conditions and concentrations of your protein to try and get it to crystallize. And then once you crystallize it, you shoot it with X-rays and then you get a diffraction pattern and then you can use that diffraction pattern to uh, well, you'll solve the phase problem and then refine the structure into the map. Uh, that probably doesn't mean anything to you, but that is that structure and then hit it with X. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, you cut off. Uh, what was the, like, the last like two cents? Yeah. So you, you just you get your crystal structure and you shoot it with X rays and then and that's how you get your structure. Um, now I will add though that there's a new method and it, my PhD was actually involved in modeling uh, with this kind of data. And that's uh, cryo-electron microscopy. So actually the Nobel Prize in chemistry this year, or I guess in 2016, uh, or 2017, sorry, was um, to the guys who originally developed this method. And um, the idea behind cryo-electron microscopy is you freeze your protein in a thin layer of vitreous ice and you shoot it with electrons. And then you can basically detect those electrons. And one of the major advances that has happened recently is these direct electron detector cameras. And so it's a camera that reads the electrons and it operates very quickly. And that's led to a number of uh, advances in the field because you can use these cameras to essentially collect frames and almost a movie of your protein as you're shooting it with electrons. You can then correct for the motion that occurs in the protein when you hit it with the electrons. And so you, those are called motion correcting algorithms. Moral of the story is there's been massive advances in this field in recent years that have led us to get much higher resolution of our protein structures. And so that's become another way in which we get, um, we get the structure of a protein. Uh, and like I said, when I did my PhD, I was developing new methods to kind of build the models into those maps and de novo modeling of cryo-electron microscopy or with cryo-electron microscopy data. Um, and then the other method that people use to get protein structures is NMR. So when I say crystal structure, what I mean is um, that, that structure that was solved with X-ray crystallography, that's the, the kind of known experimentally validated state of the protein. That's what it looks like. Is that how, so. I, would, I don't know if you read the book, gene or or not but i think that's that sounds similar to how a lady helped watson and crick get like the image or like she kind of like at the same time like figured out what, how dna looked 
trying to use like yeah if I, if I remember it right yeah yeah so um rosalind franklin um uh she worked with watson and crick uh and she was the one who took the uh the x-ray images of dna and when she showed them those x-ray images that's how they were able to fit their model into into that diffraction pattern and figure out how what the actual struck structure of dna was but yeah it's the same method exactly it's uh, um x-ray crystallography is what they use all right well that's that's good to know i now can can use that because <laughs> yeah because before yeah. i was just like i just pictured I don't know what I pictured. I don't know if you've ever seen like Stargate, SG, like a uh, Stargate Atlantis or something like that. There's like crystals everywhere, and that's how like how they store technology. So I was like, is it you guys are, like have crystals somewhere? <laughs> like, I, I don't know. It's like why do you guys have to have crystals? But n- n- now, yeah. I under- now I understand. <laughs> so um, no, these crystals are, are generally much smaller. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that's the idea. That's the idea. When you get a crystal, it's obviously occurs in a very um, uh, standardized lattice, and so you can you. That's how. Or that's why having a crystal of the, the structure lets you get accurate information about the structure. Do is there like a repository of crystalline structures, or do you have to redo it every time you're trying to do something now, or are or, or working nope. on a project? Um, yeah, the the protein data bank stores uh, a crystal structure. Well, it stores protein structures that have been solved with a variety of methods. Most of them are solved with crystallography. So yeah, the, the PDB or the protein data bank is, is the main place where all of the crystal structures get deposited and, uh, they maintain this huge database, which is invaluable for, for all sorts of printing engineering. Cause it means that we can do, we can go into that database and look for things that have already been solved and try and learn knowledge about how, how they fold and, and get statistics for different things. So it's like a, a seed bank for proteins for people. Yep. If they know uh, seed banks, <laughs> I guess this kind of harkens back to like if new ones are being made. So like, mm-hmm. I'm just kind of curious, like to what extent are have the proteins that we know exist are blah, blah, blah. I'm going to restate that because my tongue's being twined. The to what extent with the proteins that we know that exist, have we mapped them? So like, there's like a hundred percent of proteins that we know exists and maybe there's some like hidden stuff out there that we don't know exists yet, but like, we're not counting them. Yeah. So we have a hundred percent with like this bank and using every, you know, all these advances for however long we've been working on these methods. Like how much mm-hmm. as a percentage have we kind of like solidified is that we know what it looks like and we can do stuff with it. Yeah. So, uh, I think the protein data bank has about a hundred thousand different structures in it right now. Um, the number of proteins that are known to exist or thought to exist, I don't even know what that number is, but it's way, way above 100,000. <laughs> um, but that being said, because proteins are the product of evolution, uh, they cluster into protein families, right? And so that's that's what we're taking advantage of when we do homology modeling. We're taking advantage of the fact that these things might not have the exact same sequence, but they probably have some evolutionary history and so they're probably folding into a similar shape. And so that's how we use that knowledge. But, um, oh, I should know, but I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. What fraction of the, the suspected protein families have crystal structures uh, solved for them? Um, but it's a, it's a decently high percentage. Um, uh, and for, like I said, I can't remember exactly what it is off the top of my head. But uh, a good amount. But definitely not complete coverage. So, I mean, there's still a, a ton of structures. And, of course, when now we have all this sequencing data um, and this ability to sequence huge amounts of, of different organisms and all sorts of things like that, uh, we constantly discover new proteins um, and, you know, or at least suspected proteins based on on the sequence information. Um, actually one of the, one of the huge advances in the field of protein structure prediction and therefore protein engineering, um, was the incorporation of that sequence data into the modeling process, uh, what we call these coevolution constraints. And the idea there is, um, if you have, uh, a bunch of different sequence information and you know, they all come from the same structure, you can look at that sequence information and you can start to interpret things. So if you have a structure where you say have a negative charge and a positive charge that are right next to each other in space, but maybe these two residues are not next to each other in sequence space, but in actual three-dimensional shape space in the folded structure, 
If you see one change, so neg maybe the positive charge switches to a negative charge, well, now you'd have two negative charges next to each other, which would be very unfavorable. So what's going to happen is you might have the other charge switch to a positive charge. So if they're basically flip-flopping. And if you have a ton of different sequence information, you can look through all the sequences and you can see residues that are co-varying with each other. So that, that idea of the charger, there's different things you can look at. But basically, if this one swaps, then that one has to swap. And if that one swaps, this one has to swap kind of idea. And that then can inform uh, your prediction algorithm that, okay, these two things must be close together in space. And so if you have a lot of sequence information, you can build these constraint maps. And then when you run the protein structure prediction, you can get much more accurate structures of very large complexes. And that's worked really well. So we have this competition called CASP, where uh, a bunch of different groups, before structures are released and put into the PDB, they're set aside. And a bunch of different groups are given the sequence and asked to predict what the structure is. And this has been going on for years. It's how David Baker, who was the, the main uh, the lab for which Rosetta was developed in one of the main main groups in this field, um, made a name for himself. Uh, and so when this new method came on of doing these coevolution constraints, it just they were able to solve crazy hard structures that no one else could get. And so that's been getting a bunch of attention recently. It's been a major breakthrough that's happened in the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I can't remember exactly what I, I started with, <laughs> with that. Um, but it's, uh, it's something that's really interesting. It's been really exciting for our field, for sure. Well, it seems that there's just a, like this huge boom when it comes to technology, uh, biotechnology in the recent years. You know, we have like CRISPRs coming out. We have like these mm -hmm. the crazy things going on in protein. Like it seems like my, my guess would be like it's because like computers are getting really like more advanced. We have more people in the in the field. Like what would be your like thoughts on why it seems like a lot of stuff's happening right now? Like everything's like almost like another renaissance period, but with the science. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean that's a that's a tough question to answer. Like why why is biotech suddenly exploding? I think it's a, a lot of reasons. I mean definitely uh, our field is is heavily influenced by the increases in computing power. Um, but these things also build on each other. So, uh, you know, the human gene in, uh, DNA sequencing technology, which then leads to all sorts of other advances that you, that we can now take advantage of, um, because we can sequence all sorts of things really cheaply and efficiently now. And then also DNA synthesizing technology, which has been really important for us. So I think part of it is just these things all build on each other. Um, and so, you know, the fact that CRISPR allows us to now more readily and easily adapt, uh, our or engineer the sequence into our organisms means that protein engineering is easier as well. So, you know, you, you, you get both of them and then it can actually feed back on itself because then you can use protein engineering to improve your CRISPR or your, uh, your, uh, proteins that are involved in that whole system. Um, and people are doing that. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's some, a lot of positive feedback loops for these things built on each other, but uh, maybe that's just one explanation. There could be other things as well. I think but, there was... Yeah, it's been exciting. Yeah, it's just... It, especially for a very relatively young field, it just it seems like it's just like every week there's something crazy going on. But granted, there's... when it, when it I imagine when it comes to... Like, because you're doing software for, like, research, basically, if I if that's, like, a good summary of it, how what like when it comes to time span when it comes to like when you're thinking like hey i want to study something and you have like this hypothesis like how long does it take to go from from that a to z of having something per, per, either a result or knowing that it's going to be significant oh that's uh that's really hard to say it really depends on the project um yeah, I mean, it, it, it depends on what exactly you're trying to do, because some of the things we do are not particularly hard, um, you know, for just doing simple, like, uh, re-engineering and stabilizing a protein, maybe we can do that pretty quickly. Um, or if we're getting a, a structure of a homology model, you know, it can be very quick. Um, but, you know, certain protein engineering things, if we're trying to design a protein from scratch, obviously that takes uh, a lot of testing and a lot of trial and error. And that's the biggest thing is a lot of it is trial and error. So it depends if you test the right thing right at the beginning, 
and you uh, you get a hit, then you're good. Otherwise, you, know, you have to keep repeating that process. So uh, it's a hard hard thing to, to assign some specific time value on that. That's fair. I was just thinking of like the clinical stages and how like they have a rough like time estimate of like like taking like ten years from getting to one like A to Z. So I was just curious if there's like a comparable time estimate. But I I, I understand that like it's much more variable in that way. Yeah, yeah. It depends on what you're trying to do. <laughs> what is like for for listeners, what it, what are the things that you wish people knew? What are the things that you wish, like if everyone everyone who's listening is going to you know lit several thousand times in the next six weeks, what do you wish that they knew about what you do every day? What do you wish that they could take away from this and have more of appreciation with, for protein engineering or protein synthesis or design? Like what what are some things that you wish people knew more about? Yeah, I mean, I guess I just wish that people. Um we're more aware that this capability exists. Um, I would love for more people to start pushing projects involving approaching engineering. Like th there's a lot of problems out there that people are maybe trying to solve with, uh, you know, if you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail and they're trying to solve it with their hammer. And I think uh, protein engineering could be um, a big part of that. Um, but, you know, it's definitely a developing field, so it kind of depends on how, how much of an early adopter you want to be, whether you want to jump into that and, and really push it forward. Um, so it's, it's a hard thing to say. I, I would just say be aware of, uh, you know, the kind of things that we have going on, like uh, the ability to engineer enzymes for specific purposes, uh, the fact that we can, you know, uh, design protein binders for different things. And uh, if you're dealing with a problem where maybe that's what, what you need, um, take advantage of that. Uh, you know, some of the tools we, we have offer are very reliable. You know, don't go out there trying to solve a crystal structure and spending a bunch of time and money on it if it's something that could be easily solved with homology modeling. So I guess just know these tools are out there and look into them a bit before you, uh, you set out on whatever project you're working on. So if, if someone wanted to learn more, are there some either companies or, or research institutions that they should go to that that inspire you or that would give them a very good sense of what the potential is? Yeah. I mean, um, so the Institute for Protein Design at the University of Washington, they have a website. I think you've been on there that has um, various you know, videos and talks about the research that's being done. And it's going to it's going to highlight some of the key papers that have come out. Um, so I think that's a great pay place. If you're interested on the industrial side, on kind of what you can do, uh, you can check out the the Cyrus Biotechnology website, um, and that'll it'll show you some of the uh, things that we offer through that. Um, of course, the scientific literature. Uh, you know, it depends on how how detailed you want to get in there, but um, keeping uh, an eye out on papers that are coming out of. Uh, Different groups here at the Institute of Protein Design, David Baker's group, Neil King's group, um, Frank DeMeo, Nan Kai. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, most of the new science is all going to get put into scientific papers there. Um, but definitely if you're looking for more uh, just, I guess, easier reading or things that don't require you to get and maybe uh, papers that are behind paywalls, you can just check out some of these websites like the Institute for Protein Design website. it will give you a good overview. Mm -hmm. Are are you on like Twitter or something like that for so people can kind of like be watch your growth? Um, I am. I have a Twitter, but I don't really use it. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe I should, but currently no. <laughs> well, I don't know if like you had a Twitter or something like something that was out there that you generally update or something like that. I know I'd want to you know hear more about protein engineering because like the big buzzword you know is like CRISPR and genetic engineering. It's like Oh, yeah. For everything, it's like a, it's like an iceberg. I always think, whenever you hear something on the news, it's like an iceberg. Like that's the tip, but I bet there's like so much more going on beneath the surface, or so many other things that maybe you know aren't hitting the news, but are just as fascinating. And I think like protein engineering is one of those that yeah. I wasn't aware of, and so that's why I was yeah. like really excited for this discussion. Yeah, for sure. Um, the Institute for Protein Design, I believe, has a Twitter, and I believe they um, they post updates uh, when when they come out. So I would check them out for sure. And uh, Cyrus, um, we have a Twitter as well, and we we will try and post when exciting new research that uses Rosetta is being coming out as well. So yeah, I would check those two out. So that's a good place to kind of understand the research that's coming out. Is there any centers or any people that are knowledgeable in like the 
Because I, I know, like, at the the Protein Institute that we've mentioned so many times that if that's not in the show notes when I put this up, that someone should poke me in the eye. That, <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that like, someone, and we referenced in this conversation how there was the competition where uh, celiac disease, I, I believe, if I remember it correctly, how they made a protein that basically, like, counteracts the effects of it, the effects of it in the, a person's stomach. So, like, mm-hmm. and that's been developed into a biotech company. So, I'm just wondering, like, what other, like, centers when it comes to just, like, maybe just wanting to understand, like, application side of things? Like, are there any places that aggregate that type of information? Yeah. Um, well, actually, I mean, the Institute for Protein Design has, uh, you know, their research section and they have, like, a practical application section on the research section that talks about the the celiac disease binder and, and that whole uh, that whole story. Um so yeah, uh, I think that would be the best place if you're interested in specifically protein engineering stuff, and you can check out some of that um, their website there into the research section because all of those groups fall under the same. So that that's an institute actually. Uh, there's the biochemistry department and the Institute of Protein Design is in it, and there's a bunch of groups that are a part of that. So they do a good job about aggregating all the the relevant information that's going on in all the different groups there and and trying to, you know, hype it up. <laughs> are there – is the Protein Institute, is it like the number one in America or are there, are there like dual protein institutes or like other ones out there that are like that? As far as I know, it's the the dominant one. There's some individual labs that work on protein engineering, like the Zhang lab. Um, but as far as institutes go, I'm not aware of any others, but there may be. Um, there's there's other groups for like synthetic biology as well, and, and protein design kind of gets lumped into that, um, that kind of more broad field. Um, yeah, definitely. And th- those will be in the show notes. And so I'm kind of – Curious what advice you'd have for people that are interested in learning. Like if they if they they've heard everything so far, like, oh that kind of sounds interesting. What mm-hmm. what are the things that you think that if someone had a passion for would really kind of make them like be successful in protein engineering or just in this specific subset of biotechnology? Like what what are some if you I mean maybe there aren't any key indicators, but if there are key so, indicators. So I mean if you're interested in this field. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. It's good. Uh, yeah, I mean, the big thing in, in this field is uh, there's a lot of computation involved. So um, if you're interested in like picking up some Python scripting, it would be really useful for people. Um, you know, if you really want to get into it, learning C++ uh, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but obviously, you need a good background in biophysics and bio uh, structural biology as well. Um, so all those things are really useful. Um but yeah, I mean, it's really a hybrid of computer science and, and biotechnology. So anything that crosses into those two fields. But we have people coming from all over, all sorts of different fields into the into protein engineering. I think one of the guys who's doing a postdoc with David, um, David Baker, started out doing um, astronomy. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you can, you can co-opt your skill set to do whatever. Uh, there's room for a lot of different kind of uh, different backgrounds in the field for sure, for sure. All right. Excellent. Are there, if you were to recommend people like some books to kind of like get them interested to see they can kind of like learn more. Like I, I thought it was fun to read the gene book by a person who has a really, really long name. And I probably butcher if I said it wrong as like getting like a primer for genetic engineering. Is there anything like that for, Oh, I don't know of any textbooks. I certainly didn't have any when I was getting into this field. Um, <laughs> you should write one. <laughs> you should write one, and then I can blurb you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know of any, to be honest. Unfortunately, there might be some out there, and I'm just not aware of them. But, All right, if, uh, if, if anyone listening wants Brandon to write that book, <laughs> email me, and I will poke Brandon every time I get an email. So, <laughs> like, maybe this can be like another branch of income for you. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I was just thinking, I think we covered like the kind of advice in the sense that like what people should kind of self-select for, like having some coding experience. And there's like, I mean, there's so many resources online for teaching yourself coding, like Khan Academy, I think Code Academy, like they were not very sophisticated naming those. Um, so you can learn Python and, and those things out there. Is there, 
there's there's these places for coding called um, open open sourcing. Is there anything like that that people can kind of like do experiments or like do some research so that they can use that as like experience to like segue in? Or is it like more like your route of like you know get the master's degree, get the PhD, and then like be into the field or do a different method? Yeah, um, I, mean, I guess it depends. Uh, if you want to go into academia, you'll obviously have to, you know, pursue the degree path. If you want to work for a biotech company, I mean, you just have to convince them that you can do it. Um, one thing that's out there is this program called Fold It, and it's it's essentially a game uh, around protein structure prediction. And so on the back end, it's running Rosetta, which is the same, uh, you know, the same software that we use for regular protein engineering. Um, but what they'll do is they'll give out different challenges to the people who are competing, uh, and they'll try and solve different structures. Um, and oftentimes they're actually like relevant scientific problems. So there's actually been papers that have published that have had, you know, folded game players <laughs> as authors on the papers. Um, so if you just kind of want to casually jump in and you're interested in it, I would say check out Fold It um, and see, you know, it's kind of a game version, but uh, it would definitely be a nice introduction. Um, so yeah, that would be a good option for you. Where do you <laughs> see the industry going? Like, like you're kind of like at the cusp of when it comes to protein design, like you're, you know, so do you see it training in a different, in a specific direction or is there... I don't know, like, just how do, how do you see it going? Like, where is it going? Yeah, for sure. Um, so the big thing right now is most of the people who are interested in protein engineering are not interested in de novo protein design. They're mostly interested in just redesigning existing proteins to do something. A lot of times it's stability. Um, and one of the things we're really waiting for is, like, actually fully engineered novel um capability into into protein structures to start gaining tractability as as a a viable strategy for solving kind of biological challenges so um obviously uh the pvp biologics with their um gluten degrading enzyme is a major example of that and so we're hoping that as more examples come out of academia that's showing that this is a viable strategy for solving these problems, that it's going to be adopted more and more in industry. Um, but that's that's definitely the big thing we want to see is more industry users starting to take advantage of this technology and getting it outside of just academia and, and really getting it at a lot of these big pharma companies so they can start solving these more complicated problems. Um, so that's the hope on where the field is going. No, excellent. I think that's when I, I don't know if it was part of the podcast or not because we were talking beforehand. And that, that one was kind of interesting that, that this idea that people can be a part of these competitions and actually do something meaningful from it. I think that's just like mm -hmm. just utterly fantastic. Our, I think that maybe that's another opportunity to like fold it. Like should people try and like get a bunch of you know people together potentially or like see what other or, uh, competitions are out there and kind of do something like that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you can definitely pursue that if you're interested. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, if you're an academic group, there's uh, – so the, the gluten degrading protein came out of that um, – oh, I'm totally having a brain fart at the moment. Um, I can't remember the competition at the moment, but it's a, it's a synthetic biology competition for undergrads. IGEN, yeah, thank you. I couldn't remember. Yeah, IGEN. You know, the IGEN competition. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's – uh, in a program for undergrads. So if there's any undergrads out there who are interested in that kind of thing, you can set up your own iGEM team and it's uh, all sorts of synthetic biology problems that they work on. Um, so yeah, I mean, you never know. Um, but that's a good option for maybe, I think it's still people who are in academia, but maybe we're just starting out. So I think the last question, unless we, you know, spin off on a series of more questions, which I'm open with, which is, is completely on you. What, what it, wh where do you want to go from here out? Like we talked about where proteins are going to go. We talked about kind of like the new advances. Like what what's next for Brandon? Like where do you want to go in life? <laughs> and I hope I don't give you an existential crisis. Like I'm just kind of curious. Oh, no, no, no. I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, yeah, I mean uh, I definitely want to continue to be a part of this field as we push it forward. I would really like to see um, – I would really like to see a, an entire platform for 
working with proteins uh, be developed, uh, protein-based drugs specifically. So things like uh, getting a protein inside a cell is a challenging problem, and I'd like to work on problems that are uh, – or work on solutions to that problems. So things like Neil King's cage design. Um, but I mean, right now we're, we're just growing the company, uh, Cyrus, and there's some talk that maybe we'll expand into some more wet lab or maybe not wet lab, but doing science that's actually engineering proteins for different things. Um, so we'll see what, what goes on with that. Um, but obviously I've been, I've been working for the company as a long time as an independent contractor, but I just started working with them full time in December when I finished my PhD. So, I mean, there's a huge number of things that we need to get done, <laughs> um, over there. So right now I'm mostly just working on trying to get all that out there. And like I said, uh, I would love to expand the capabilities and I, I want this to be a tool that gets used broadly. Um, and to make that happen, we need to make it user usable. Um, and we need to show people that this works. <laughs> so I, I'm happy to kind of push that forward as much as I can. And that's what I'd like to continue doing. What would it take? Like if you could, if you had like God powers or, <laughs> or whatever, or I guess if you had God yeah. powers, you wouldn't need, you do not have God powers because then you could just heal everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, like what would it take? Like what, do you, do you have like any idea on like what would it take to get to that level? Like, you know, maybe resource funding, types of people working on it, how many people working on it. I mean, I don't know, like it's a, it's a very big question. So, like, it's cool if like there's not like that detailed of a of a of a response. But I'm just kind of curious, like, what would it take to get yeah. to that level? Yeah, um, we really need like standardized, robust. You, you cut out again. I think that uh, those are probably. Oh, sorry. Uh, we're going to need standardized, robust strategies that people can use that work routinely. Um, and so we need just more people working on it um, since that is probably largely going to come out of ac academia. I mean, uh, it's always great to get more science funding um, uh, and a specific focus on kind of translational um, uh, translational methods. And I like the kind of move to have academics working with industry partners on specific problems to try and get these things solved so that we can actually, you know, push everything forward. Um, so there's specific scientific advances that need to happen, but as with anything in science, you know, you don't really know what works until you figure it out. So, uh, it's hard to say. Um, but you know, the more people that are working on these problems, the better, um, the faster that we're going to get it done and start, you know, actually making a, a big impact on human disease well i think that's a, a great way to end this podcast with this idea of like hope for the future and this idea of that you know things are trending in a, in a good direction unless i misheard in our podcast but it seems like things, things <laughs> no, are trending things good <laughs> okay uh, things are trending in, in, in a good direction but like anything you know like it needs support from the public from people who are listening and is there anything and this kind of maybe this isn't a question that you'd be able to answer like uh like the policy well, we had elizabeth when I asked this question, she was like, oh, you can actually message, you know, congressmen and stuff like that. Is there anything that people who are listening can do to be supportive? Like, even if it's just sending you guys an email saying, hey, I really like to learn about it. This is fascinating. Like, anything that helps you guys. Like, is there anything that people listening can do to help? Sure. Um, well, of course, there's all the generic stuff like, you know, support science funding. I mean, all of this is largely paid for by taxpayers. And, and that's kind of generally true of all science. Um, if you want to get really specific, one way in which you can actually help uh, us specifically in the field of protein engineering is um, by getting Rosetta at home, <laughs> which uh, what that will do is it essentially is a, a screensaver that runs on your computer. And whenever your computer is idle, uh, we will actually run scientific protein folding and protein engineering jobs on your computer. Uh, as this while well, this screen straver is on um, so if you want to sign up for that and give us your computer whenever you're not using it uh, that would be great um, we will happily take advantage of it and uh, we use uh, I so with the company we run everything on the cloud but for academics they use that whole Rosetta at home system which is all donated compute and I think the Baker Lab, if they actually had to pay for it, would be using something like $2 million worth of compute every month. So this stuff is very computationally in intensive, and uh, the more people who are willing to let us use their computers, the better. So uh, if you want to help us out in that way, that would be great. Is there is there any cost to it, and how would they do that? 
Uh, there's no cost uh, to doing it. No, uh, I can't remember the exact website, but if you Google Rosetta at home, I'm checking it out right now. Um, yeah, it's the boink.bakerlap.org, Rosetta at home. And there's just a button you can click to join Rosetta at home. And you just install that program and that's it. Um, it'll just run whenever you're not using your computer. And, uh, you know, there's definitely, obviously, we wouldn't charge you to let you donate your computer. To us, so. <laughs> I always, I'm, always, I'm always fearful of those paywalls. <laughs> no, no paywalls. No, happy to, happy to take your compute resources. That's like a really small thing. It's like filling up your tires to the fullest extent, like saves gas. So it's like little, yeah. little small things. Like everyone does a, a, a couple of things. Everyone else, you know, like protein engineers, fuel economy and all that type of stuff. And it does make an impact. I think there was a, yeah. as like a weird analogy, I think like if you fill up your tires, like if I ever fill up the tires to the right amount, millions of barrels of gas a year, yeah. like, bit, like, like tons of it. It's like, yeah. wow, that's, I check my tires very religiously now like because yeah. of that. And they do go down. Like, it's, it's really yeah. surprising. Like, so this is like that, you know, to make, to make the analogy like swing at home, this is the equivalent of just checking your tires and being helpful. Yeah. And it, yeah. it kicks you back because like these protein things, like, like we talked about uh, several times, like celiac disease, because of this protein engineering, is now having, you know, biotechno- a biotechnology company that's working on having effective like yeah. treatment would be a good word for it, a, 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 an effective way to combat it. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. No, it has real world applications that are actually helping people. Well, at least we're in clinical trials or going into clinical trials. <laughs> All right, well, then I want to thank you for coming out. Thank you for listening today. Please subscribe, leave a review, check out our website, learningwithlowell.com, or join my mailing list. I'm here to learn and share what I learn. New episodes every Tuesday, new emails every Monday, and I blog on topics that I find fascinating.